Well, good morning, Hillcrest. Uh, sorry about yesterday. I was sitting out on my front porch, recorded the video. Uh, it was a beautiful day, and somehow the audio didn't record. And so I uh, just had computer problems. I know that seems to be a common theme uh, with us with YouTube these days. But I uh, wanted to, to get in this morning and go ahead and record what I did yesterday um, and get that out. Um, so, you know, nothing, nothing yesterday, but, but uh, double your fun today, I suppose. Um, so we're back in, in Genesis chapter 12, and we're looking at the promises that God has made to Abraham, uh, particularly at this time, he's still called Abram, but uh, the promises that God is making to him and, and looking at the all, all sorts of things, of course, right? Uh, the idea of the relationship between God and Abraham, the covenant promises, the covenant relationship. Um, looking at the way in which Abraham responds to God, looking at the way in which uh, God, through these promises, is revealing his character, his plan, his program for salvation. Um, and so last week we looked at uh, just the first three verses, the first verse on Monday, the second two on Thursday, uh, to see these are the, the first promises that God makes. Uh, and so today I want to pick it up in verse four. We're not going to read the whole of Genesis, uh, but there's another promise here and there's another uh, important aspect of what, what is here. So I want us to read uh, verses uh, four through nine. Uh, it begins, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of the place at Shechem to the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going to war at the Negev. So this passage uh, indicates, first of all, uh, Abram's uh, obedience to the command that God had given. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Uh, Abram does precisely that. He takes his family. Uh, he takes his uh, uh, his, uh, his immediate family, but also Lot, his, his nephew, and travels south toward the land of Canaan. And interesting, when when Abram arrives at Canaan, um, into the promised land, as we might call it, but for him it was Canaan, right? Um, he he passes through the land. He's he's moving in the direction, you know, southerly direction, and it's there that God appears to him and fulfills the first promise that we saw all the way back in verse one, all the way back. I mean, it's only a handful of verses, but back in verse one, um, that. God had promised to show Abraham a land. Right? Go to the land that I will show you. That, that's, a, that's a promise. There is a, uh, a future event that has not occurred that God is, is declaring he, he's going to do something. And immediately we see God do that. And I think that's one of the important pieces of this promise that he has in verse 7, to your offspring I will give this land, is that the first thing that God is doing is he is fulfilling a promise, uh, that he is demonstrating his trustworthiness uh, to his servant Abraham. Um, he makes that promise, I will show you a land, and then he appears and says, here you are, this is it. Um, and, and so there is going to be this sort of theme throughout Abraham's life of the fulfillment of promises. Um, now, not every promise is fulfilled, right? I mean, he, Abraham never owns the land. Um, his offspring, at least during his lifetime, never owned the land. Um, even by any standard, the, the family that Abram, Abraham gets to see in his lifetime is nothing, it's no nation. It's not a, it's not a great nation. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a small family by ancient standards or a relatively small family by ancient standards. Um, so there's all kinds of promises that Abraham will not see in this life, but there is this reality that God is fulfilling 
promises, even while Abraham and his offspring wait for the larger, the fuller promises. Uh, God is showing Abraham and us through the text. He's showing us here is a trustworthy God. He makes promises and he keeps them. But the other amazing thing about this promise in verse 7 is the way in which God is not backing down. Um, you, you might imagine, um, I mean, if you've ever answered a advertisement, uh, whether it's like a mailer or something on television or something uh, online or whatever, and the, the advertisement is filled with enormous promises, right? I mean, everything price to go and, and, and things like that. And then you arrive and you're like, well, you know, I don't really think this car is priced to go. Well, no, not, not this car, but, but that one over there, the 17-year-old Yugo with only three tires and 700,000 miles, that one is priced to go. And you're like, well, yeah, okay. Um, right, I mean, there's an idea where sort of the bait and switch, right? We're gonna make these promises and then we're gonna, we're gonna fulfill a couple of them, but really the idea is we are just trying to manipulate you or motivate you to do something that we want. And that is not at all what God is doing. Right? On the one hand, he's fulfilling the promise, but he doesn't back away. In fact, he expands the promises that he's made. Um, if, go back up into the, the, well, I mean, I'm looking at them, but go back up into the first three verses. Um, he's going to make him a great nation. There's that promise there, but there's no specific promise of children necessarily, or even of a land. He's going to show him a land, but it doesn't say any much more than that. I'm going to show it to you. Um, now, both of those imply something greater, uh, but they're not explicit. Um, theoretically, God could make Abraham a great nation by causing him to become the king of a nation that currently exists. I mean, that's at least feasible and possible. That, that is a way that God could have fulfilled that promise. Um, and in that sense, you know, he would have, he could have immediately stepped into that. But God here in verse seven is describing the way in which he is going to make Abraham a great nation. He's going to give him offspring and he's going to give him a land. Um, and, and again, it's not going to be given to Abraham. Abraham is going to get the offspring, but the offspring will get the land. And so it is an expansion. It is a, um, an explicit filling out of the promise that God has already made. Um, and one of the things I think is marvelous about this, again, is this idea that, that there are still more marvelous things that will occur. Um, Abraham isn't even in a place yet to appreciate the reality of the promise of uh, Exodus, which will come later in the, in the discussion, uh, what Abraham and God are, are saying. Um, Abraham is certainly not ready for the fullness of the reality, the revelation of the coming of Christ Jesus or uh, the spreading of Abraham's children according to faith throughout the entire world and, and throughout all time, really. Um, he's not prepared for those things. Um, they're not going to have the same meaning to him as the things that he is being you know, that are being revealed now. And it just reminds us that, that God is working in cosmic ways. Uh, I mean, certainly, we have the fullness of the revelation of God's plan for salvation. That doesn't mean that we know who is going to be saved or we know all the intricacies of that promise, but we certainly have the, the marvelous fullness of the reality of the accomplishment of our salvation as we see it in Christ Jesus. Uh, but we also know that God is not finished working. Right? We have the book of Revelation, which, which provides for us um, hints and pictures and uh, types of the reality that is coming in the future when Jesus Christ returns. Um, but we, we are, even Christians are going to be amazed at the marvelous manner in which God fulfills those promises. Um, the way in which Christ fills out those types, those shadows that you see even in the New Testament of what it means for him to return. And so it's a reminder that, that even the promises that God has made that do reveal his character, that reveal his faithfulness, that reveal his love, his compassion, his grace, his mercy, um, 
there is a there is a greater reality behind all of those things, and that greater reality is our triune God, uh, that that He is the fullness of all glory, of all majesty, of all love, of all perfections, um, and even in the way in which God is slowly revealing Himself to Abraham um, is. Uh, in a way, sort of conditioning Abraham, conditioning us to continue to expect marvelous, wonderful things from this God. And the last thing that we see here is the proper response to a faithful, loving, generous, gracious God. What does Abraham do? Um, well, he, he continues to move on a little bit anyway, um, but there in Bethel, he builds an altar to the Lord, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Um, that, and, and actually, you could even add in, a, in verse 9, and Abraham continued to journey on, right? That, that the proper response to God's revelation of his character is worship. Um, now, of course, you know, building an altar is a proper expression of worship in the Old Testament. We don't build altars today. In this, you know, but um, the idea is that Abraham worships the Lord. He calls upon his name. He praises him. He recognizes the glory and the greatness and the majesty of his God, and he ascribes those things to him. Um, Abraham confesses his recognition of who God is and what God has accomplished. But then also verse 9 is, is not a throwaway line because Abraham continues to journey through the land that God is promising to him. Right, uh, he's up on the mountain. He looks around. He sees um, this land, and God says, "It's yours. I'm giving it to your offspring." And so Abraham's like, "Well, if you're giving this to me and my offspring, my offspring, if you're giving it to my offspring, then I'm going to go and I'm going to walk over all of it. I'm going to go look. I'm going to go search it out. I'm going to go. go I'm going to go check it out." Uh, but it's going in faith and in obedience. Faith, because the land doesn't belong to him. Obedience, because God has said, this is the land I'm giving to your descendants. And so Abraham wants to, to see it. Abraham wants to uh, begin to exercise proper dominion over the promised land, over the land that God is going to give to his descendants. And so it's, it's worship, but it's also obedience. It is continuing to trust in God and continuing to do uh, precisely what he calls us to. And in this case, it is go to that land. And so he's going to fulfill uh, his obligations to his covenant God. Well, my, my prayer is, is that uh, particularly coming off of yet or day before yesterday, uh, a day of worship, a day where um, so many more of us have gathered together than we have in, in months, um, that we would recognize the fulfillment of the promises that God has made to us in Christ Jesus, and that that is the basis for our gathering for worship. We come to worship a God of promise, and a God who has fulfilled promises, and a God who continues to promise things both present and future for his people. And our proper response is to trust him, to believe those promises, to gather together, to praise his name, to give thanks, to call upon his name, and then to do what he calls us to do as we go out into this world and seek to bring a proper dominion of God's grace and mercy and love out into this world. And all of that from uh, just a handful of verses describing Abraham's response uh, to the command and to the promise fulfilled uh, from God. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you this day for your grace, your goodness, the promises that you continue to fulfill in our lives. We ask that you would bless us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen us with your word, with your power, with your promises. And we pray, Father, that you would fuel our worship as we contemplate the many promises, not only that you have made and continue to make, but the many promises, O oh Lord, that you have fulfilled in our lives. We pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I'll look forward later today to another uh, uh, message from uh, Pastor Richmond, and I'll be back on Thursday, hopefully uh, without any 
delay.